So let's go in and learn a little bit about what is modern agriculture. Oh, sorry. Here's a great example. So this is, a, this is an example. This is, again, this is corn. Corn is, is one of the most prolific uh, crops that we have today. But maybe people don't understand its history. 7,000 years ago, the first, quote, unquote, corn was a, was a plant called teacente. It looks closer to actually wheat than it did corn 7,000 years ago. Up to 1,000 years ago, we finally have something that actually looks like a corn plant. It took 6,000 years of breeding to get teacente from that little tiny squib of a wheat-like thing into what we can call corn. Today, now, modern corn has now emerged to be, again, it's a, it's a global product that's being produced. It's taken 7,000 years to go from teacente to what we know now as modern corn. Now, w what does that translate? Well, algae's got to be the same way, okay? I can't use a wild-type algae to actually go to a large-scale agricultural process. You have corn, you have wheat, you have soybeans. You have all these examples that you look from ag. All of them require the ability to change it and to domesticate it. That is my main focus scientifically at SAFAR, is to domesticate algae, give it all the traits that one needs to make it an actual energy crop. And that itself, and using those verbiage and that word is powerful. So I'm talking about the design of an energy crop. To be a crop, you have to have all the traits to actually go to large-scale production. One of the issues that I face, though, is like, unlike Piacente, I don't have 7,000 years, and I don't even have 7,000 days. So with that in mind, I'm going to have to accelerate it. I'm going to have to borrow modern techniques and breeding, bring it all together for us to actually hit the timelines that we're going to need to make a difference. There are four traits in agriculture that make a difference. And again, all these ideas I share with you, none of them were mine. I just happened to spend some time reading textbooks on agriculture and learn from what farmers need to go ahead. Here are the four, ma four main categories one has to have. One is crop protection. If you, can't, if you can't grow your crop and it's not protected, then you're just growing things up to feed things that are actually not our gasoline, our diesel, or, or our jet fuel. You need crop protection. It's the number one trait that makes all the difference in a farmer's life. Secondarily is the ability to harvest. How does one take algae out of these large ponds, out of this large waterway, and to make harvesting far more cost effective? Using giant centrifuges is not going to be the answer. How do I get the algae out of the water? How do I make harvesting a much more cost-effective procedure? Product profile, again, another page out of agriculture. How can I turn what's being produced in algae to make it far more profitable? As an idea of that is, if I'm going to make fuel, if I'm going to make crude oil, I'd rather make it look like Texas sweet versus what comes out of a shell up in Canada. So when you're talking about product, make the right product for the cost to return. Last is yield. Yield is the most important aspect about agriculture. And a good example of yield is having the ability to grow algae, as I said before, not in fresh water, but in salt water, so you can increase its ability to grow in many different areas. So that way you can increase your yield overall. Actually, the data that I'm going to show today in the next two slides, I have not talked about in public. This is the first time I've spoke about it, uh, especially uh, the next slide, which is very exciting. So the four categories that I talk about, these four traits that are important in agriculture, they turn out to be just as important in algae. So what we did immediately was we were able to make algae Roundup resistant. Great herbicide, one of the most powerful herbicides that has shaped uh, the, the modern agricultural revolution has been now I can protect my crop. That was the first trait that we did was to get Roundup resistant. Secondarily was how could we harvest the algae and get it out of the ponds? This was actually quite clever molecular biology. We were able to turn a trigger and to get algae to actually clump and then float. So instead of using large centrifuges, I had a molecular trigger that I would turn on. The algae would all come together. It would float, and you could harvest it directly from the ponds without actually using centrifugation. Again, using molecular biology. Third is actually engineering a novel hydrocarbon. This hydrocarbon has a much higher energy density than algal oil itself. And now I'm able to sculpture the algae oil to look far more like Texas sweet than anything else before, increasing its energy density. The last one is its ability to grow in salt water. So we were able to take a freshwater organism, change its genetics, and now it can grow in brackish water. Why the picture of a surfer? I'm from San Diego. You always got to put a surfer in your talk. It's kind of a standard thing. We like that. <laughs> now I want to go back to yield, because yield is so important. 
Um, it just really is. It's the hallmark of agriculture. How does one improve yield and increase yield? And again, this is the first time I've shared um, this work out of my lab. What we've done here is we've looked at photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most powerful chemical reaction in the world today. It is the source of all life as we know it. Photosynthesis takes CO2, it takes water, and it takes, those two, it takes two carbons and it fuses them together. It's that chemical bond between the two carbons, that's the energy stored, that we use. You break that carbon bond and you take that energy and that's what you use to run everything else off. So photosynthesis is the key to being able to make the fuels that we want and to get the yield that we want. What we've done most recently, I'm actually giving another talk on Wednesday here in, here in DC, is we've been able to make a, a synthetic chloroplast. All photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast of algae and in most plants, or all plants, I should say. We've been able to make a synthetic version of it and make a system that allows us for the first time ever to evolve photosynthesis, where we can drive the process. It's very powerful science, and it's gonna make a huge, huge deal for us when we go forward to increase yield in algae. If you've noticed, though, right next to my algae picture is a corn picture, because what also you find out is that this, this is gonna have a huge impact on all crop plants, too. If you can increase photosynthesis in crop plants, the yield you're gonna get will be tremendous. So again, it's the marriage of energy and algae, and now agriculture that you're seeing is gonna make a big turning point. So what I'm talking about is about energy, but you can see it's gonna have a huge impact on agriculture also. How's this all gonna work out? Well, again, it wasn't difficult look in the books and find out an example from ag how actually one would do these things. And one of the first things to look at is how rice is grown. Rice is, is again, 27% of all the, all of the dietary energy comes from rice. And it's all done for $0.30 dollars per kilogram. That's extremely cheap. So what you see is in the top picture, that's, how, that's an algae farm or what an algae farm should look like. It should look like a rice paddy. Below is not an algae farm. That actually is the fountain at the Bellagio. <laughs> so, why am I showing you that? It's because I sure I could grow algae in that great fountain. It has lights and it has like things jumping up and down. I bet I could get great yields in that pond uh, at the Bellagio. One can grow corn in a greenhouse. That also gets you great yield, but we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Because it's about cost. So again, the top picture, that's what an algae farm looks like. The bottom picture is not an algae farm. And, and why do I bring that up? Because again, colleagues of mine in this field keep talking about how we're gonna use these giant bioreactors to grow the algae up. It's not cost effective. We don't grow corn that way, we're not gonna grow algae that way. Where are we at today? We've been very blessed in a lot of ways. The Department of Energy, the USDA, has granted Sapphire Energy $104 million to build an integrated biorefinery. I'm breaking ground in September on this. It's gonna consist of 300 acres. We're gonna be producing 80 barrels a day. The whole point of this is to ask the question, what's the cost of producing fuel when you're at 10 acres to when you're at 300 acres? Is it, is it really scale and cost? Can you truly bring the cost down when you hit the sizes that we're gonna need to make a difference? And the USDA and the Department of Energy is help us to answer that question. So again, groundbreaking on this facility, which is in southern New Mexico, begins in September, and we should be fully online in, uh, by 2012. Next question, have we actually made any fuel? The answer is yes. As I talked about, we make fuel that makes a difference. It has to fit into infrastructure. We've made jet fuel, we've made gasoline, and we've made diesel. These are two examples. One of the first things I focused on was making jet fuel. And why? Because there's nothing like jet fuel mimicked. You can't mimic jet fuel. It has a precise chemical makeup, and it's the most difficult fuel to make. We made over 600 gallons of jet fuel. We flew a plane out of Tokyo. We flew a plane out of Houston on Continental as a demonstration um, of the fuel's capabilities. We've made diesel and gasoline, have driven a car across the country, actually from Sacramento to the White House, as another demonstration that we can make these fuels. And these fuels are exactly what you would think they are, nothing different. Let me go through now and summarize, last two slides. What is the point then? The first point is, is that, is this truly scalable? The answer is yes. All we had to do was to make algae a crop, and then it became scalable. Secondarily, if you're gonna make fuel, it has to be fungible. It has to fit into the infrastructure of today. That is so important. If I didn't make a fuel that could, I could have delivered to you, then I need to make two companies. One company to make the fuel, another company to deliver it to the customers. Don't do it. 
There's a great infrastructure. We have great gas stations everywhere. Have that as part of your delivery method to get your product out. Don't try to make a brand new fuel that we have to break a brand new infrastructure for. Critically important. As I said before, do not compete with arable land and do not compete with fresh water. Don't do it. That's not a long-term solution. Last, and the other thing that people don't often talk to me, is what's the CO2 usage? You have to have a fav favorable CO2 usage, and we have a reduction of 70% of our footprint using our technology, and that most of that is by the CO2 that we consume. In ending, uh, what I want to talk about and finish up on the note is, we look at energy right now, and this conference is about energy, but I want to put it out to you that how we're going to solve this solution is, is using agriculture. And, it, and by fusing energy and agriculture and biotechnology, that really is going to be the solution. So we have to look toward how ag can make these solutions happen. So that's really where we're at today. And what we are, we are really in the midst of a brand new agricultural revolution and a brand new platform. Thank you. Thank you, Director.